you have a Bible, and I hope you do, let me invite you to open with me to Exodus chapter 32. In light of what we've already heard earlier this morning, I'm so overwhelmed right now by this word that I'm about to preach. I'm overwhelmed by the realities that I'm about to address. Relenting wrath. The wrath of God. The role of desperate prayer in our lives, in our families, in our churches, in the mystery of divine providence in the universe, I am not adequate for this task. And I I feel the need to pray from the start, but even in in that, I know, so I, I know that I have this tendency when I'm praying in public, especially at the beginning of a sermon like this, just to bow my head and say some words that seem to set up my sermon well. I even have this sin-sick tendency in a setting like this to to try to pray in a way that will impress you. And at the same time, I I know, at least I, I think, that many of us, many of you probably have a tendency when we bow our heads in a room this size to pray, we have this tendency to just let our minds begin to wander and within seconds of me starting to pray, hundreds, maybe thousands of us in this room will be thinking about other things, details of our day, things we need to do, calls we need to make, messages we need to check, or we're going to eat, just a myriad of thoughts around this room, so in a matter of seconds, if, if we're not careful, there can be this perfunctory prayer exercise going on in this place, while all of heaven is just shouting, do you realize who you're talking to? Do you, do you realize what you're doing? You're talking to God. 7,000 of you at one time talking to God. And He is listening. Sure, he's upholding Mars at the same time. Trillions of other stars that he knows by name. Sustaining every single organ of 7.2 billion people on the planet. But you have God's attention in this place. So, don't let your mind wander. And treat prayer like it's perfunctory. It's not. It's powerful. So, can, can we just bow our heads and together still our minds and contemplate the wonder and the beauty and the glory and the majesty of the one to whom we're praying? Oh God, we need you. Our hearts are beating in the silence of this room only because you're giving them rhythm. You, 
You're the only reason any one of us is alive right now. You're the only reason every one of us is not in hell right now. You are our Savior, our Creator, our Sustainer, our King, our Lord, our God. And we we're saying together right now, we want to hear from you. We want, we want your presence to rest in a powerful way in this place. God, we pray for that. We pray that you would do something. Your word, by your power in the next few minutes even, for which only you can get glory. We want to know you more. We want to know you more. Let him who boasts boast in this. He knows and understands me. This is our desire. We want to know you more. We want to know, we want to know your wrath and your love and your justice, and your grace, and your goodness, and your glory. We want to know who you are more. And we want to know, we want to know how these attributes of yours apply to our lives. And particularly the way we pray in our lives, in our families, in our churches, and as as the church. So, we ask these things, Lord Jesus, in your name, that the Father may be glorified in this room. Amen. Amen. Prayer is a huge hole in the canvas of the Reformed resurgence and most other forms of Christianity today. These were the words of John Piper in a recent conversation concerning trends in the church landscape. By, by God's grace, you and I have witnessed a revival of theology that views God as absolutely sovereign, and man is utterly sinful, and the gospel as supremely glorious. By God's grace, we have seen a renewed interest in ecclesiology and the marks of the church that matter most to God. By God's grace, we are watching the ways that this theology and ecclesiology fuel and inform missiology as zeal for God's glory propels church planters into cities and missionaries to move overseas. A plethora of blogs written and books written, conferences held, conversations had about theology, ecclesiology, missiology, all of these things attest to the prevalence of these trends. Yet, in the midst of it all, something glaring is missing, brothers and sisters. A huge hole in Piper's words. And then all is prayer. D.A. Carson similarly laments the sheer prayerlessness that characterizes so much of the Western church. Where are the plethora of books written and blogs posted? Conversations had and conferences held on prayer and fasting in our day. We, we look back at the days of the Westminster Assembly where brothers gathered like this, but not just for preaching, they gathered to pray. They would preach for an hour and then pray for an hour. They would pray for two hours and then preach for two hours, a concept that is totally foreign among us today. 
Amid a right emphasis on the preaching of God's word, where is the equally right emphasis on praying as God's people? In the, in the words of Kevin Young in that masterful sermon, we have nothing but the word of God and, and, and prayer. So why is it then that you and I, and I include myself in this, I include myself in this, why is it that you and I spend hours every week in the church devoted to the ministry of the word while we spend minutes every week in the church devoted to the ministry of prayer? You look at mighty movements of God from biblical to contemporary history, from Nehemiah to the New Testament church, from 17th century Puritans to 19th century laymen and students, and you will see a steady stream of men and women who are known for their passionate panting after God. They were known for their desperate desire to love Him, to be long with Him, to experience power with Him from the confines of the prayer closet to the corners of planet Earth. I fear that this is not what we are known for in our day. We, we are known today, and I include myself in this, we're known for our preaching and our teaching, for our writing and our blogging, our organizing, our strategy, our planning and our planting, but we are not known for our praying and our fasting. And in this, we are in profound danger of missing the whole point. God wills for us to be a praying people. God wills to work in the world in ways that echo the cries of his children. Maybe another way to put that. God brings about remarkable change in the world in response to the prayers of his people. Maybe one more way to put that, just to be clear. Our prayers affect the way God acts in the world. Now, I know that as soon as I say that, I make many of us uncomfortable. Our prayers affect the way God acts in the world. Am I sure about that? What about God's sovereignty and God's providence? Can your prayers, can my prayers really affect what God has already predestined to occur? And that, the very question that causes us to wonder how much prayer can really accomplish, shows us that we have a defective understanding of divine providence. My aim in the next few moments is to show us, in the Word of God, to show us how a right doctrine of providence results in relentless devotion to prayer. How a right doctrine of providence results in relentless devotion to prayer. I would even add relentless confidence in prayer and relentless power through prayer. Now, in order to show us this, I want to read one of the most biblically baffling, practically provoking stories in all of Scripture, starting in Exodus 30. Two. After God had miraculously delivered his people out of slavery in Egypt, he leads them to Mount Sinai, he reveals his glory to them, he gives them his law. Moses goes up on the mountain to meet with God while the people wait at the foot of the mountain. And as the people's representative stands at the top of the mountain with God on their behalf, this is what happens. Verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. 
And the Lord said to Moses, go down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. We'll stop at verse 14 for now. In a moment, we'll pick up at the end of this chapter and then move into chapter 33. What I want to do in this text is to show us what Moses knows and how Moses prays. So I want to show us what Moses knows and how Moses prays in order to help us see how what we know about God in this room should affect how we pray to God in our lives and our families and our churches. So we'll start with what Moses knows. Four things, four truths here. Number one, Moses knows that the perfections of God are unchanging. The perfections of God are unchanging. Now, when I I use the word perfections here, I'm referring to the perfect attributes of God that permeate his entire being. These things never change. God is perfectly holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, Isaiah 6.3. He is without error and he is without equal. And that will never, ever change. God is perfectly loving. God is love, 1 John 4, 16. God not only demonstrates love, he defines it. God is perfectly just, a faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he, Deuteronomy 32, 4. So just, just ponder the paradoxical perfections of God. He is perfectly transcendent and perfectly imminent at the same time. He's perfectly full of wrath and perfectly full of love at the same time. He is perfectly self-existent and perfectly self-sufficient. He is perfectly omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, all at the same time. And in all of these attributes, in all of these attributes, he says in Malachi 3, 6, I, the Lord, do not change. He does not change like shifting shadows, James 1, 17. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13. Brothers and sisters, Psalm 90 is true. From everlasting to everlasting, God is God. The perfections of God are unchanging, and we know this. Moses knew this. Listen to his prayer from the start in verse 11. He says, O Lord, he he calls on the covenant name of God, which represents God's constant revelation of himself, starting in Exodus 3. Moses goes on to acknowledge God's wrath while appealing to God's love. He acknowledges God's might while appealing appealing to God's mercy. He acknowledges God's glory while pleading for God's goodness. Moses' prayer is plainly grounded in the unchanging perfections of God. And, And we know this in this room. We know that God does not change, and we know that that is a very good thing. For if God could change, that could mean he could change either for the better or for the worse, neither of which would be good. If God could change for the worse, we would have no foundation for our faith. We would have a faint hope on which to hold. But if God could change for the better, that would mean he wasn't the best possible being in the first place. And how could we be sure then that he's the best possible being now? Mark it down. God is not malleable. 
He does not open or progressive, gradually learning or subtly growing. Matthew 5, 48, our heavenly father is perfect, period. Moses knows, God help us to know, the perfections of God are unchanging. Second, Moses knows the purposes of God are unchanging. Verse 12, Moses appeals to the purpose of God. You, you brought your people out of Egypt for your praise among the Egyptians. Your purpose was not to kill them, but to save them. For your name's sake among the nations. And that purpose, Moses pleads, is not changed. Moses is relaying in prayer truth that reverberates throughout God's word. Psalm 33, 11, The plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart throughout all generations. Isaiah 46, God says, My purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. Moses knows that the aims of God do not undergo amendment or adjustment. Because the aims of God are always achieved. Moses knows, God help us never to forget that God governs every single detail on the globe for the glory of his name. His purposes are unchanging. Third, Moses knows that the promises of God are unchanging. What shockingly bold language in verse 13. As Moses says, remember to God. Ha! Remember. To the omniscient God who knows all things, who not only knows all things, but ordains all things, and knows all things that he has ordained at all times, Moses has the appalling audacity to say to God, maybe you need to remember something. Did you forget Abraham? Isaac? Israel, Moses points to the patriarchs and he says, you promised them you'd give them their family, the land to which you're now leading them. You cannot go back on your word. Moses knows Numbers 23, 19, that God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Moses knows what the psalmist will later say in Psalm 33. The word of the Lord is upright and all his work is done in faithfulness. God himself says in Psalm 89, I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. Praise God for this reality. Praise God that his promises to us are not pathetic. Praise God that his promise of forgiveness in our lives is not feeble. Praise God that his promise of unending life with him is not in doubt because of unforeseen limits in him. Praise God, Matthew 24, that though all heaven and earth shall pass away, his words shall not pass away. Moses knows, may we know that the promises of God are unchanging. Isn't it interesting, brothers and sisters, that in the very passage in the Old Testament that sparks the most discussion about what changes in God, Moses bases his entire prayer on that which never changes in God. Now, that brings us to verse 14. Where the Bible tells us that the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. So how are we to understand this? Because amidst all that is unchanging in God, it certainly seems like something changed here. Just four verses before this, God said to Moses, verse 10, Let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against these people and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. And now God relents. He relented. A word that's translated in some Bibles, he repented. In other Bibles, literally, he changed his mind. It's the same word that's used in other places in Scripture to describe how people change their minds. It's the same words, word that's used in some places in Scripture, like Numbers 23, to describe how God doesn't change his mind. Listen to 1 Samuel 15, 29. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind. He is not a man that he should change his mind. So what is going on here? Fourth truth that Moses notes. Perfections of God are unchanging. Purposes of God unchanging. Promises of God are unchanging. Yet, fourth, the plan of God is unfolding. The plan of God is unfolding. Now, follow with me here. 
by separating plan of God off like this, I'm not implying that God's plan is changing. So we've already covered that when we think about God's perfections, purposes, promises. God is perfectly sovereign. His purposes are fixed. He's faithful to all his promises. He does all that he pleases. And this is obviously important, for if God's plan is not fixed, then God is apparently, God's plan is apparently out of control, which a variety of popular and practical theologies would claim today. God is not sure what's going to happen next in history. He is responding to the wants and whims of man, and ultimately, he doesn't know what he's doing. This, brothers and sisters, is heresy. God does know what he's doing. God is ordaining all that's happening. When we come to Exodus 32, we must realize that God is not surprised by what's taking place here. God is not surprised when his people sin, and God is not surprised when Moses prays. God's will is as settled here as it is anywhere else in Scripture. But we have this story for a reason, because this story shows us the unfolding plan of God. This story powerfully portrays how God judges men in their sin. The people of Israel sin against God. They sin grievously against God. God says they've turned away, they are stiff-necked, and they are worthy of destruction, of death. That's true. Remember, remember, this is the unchanging character of God. He is holy, and he will judge men in their sin. Sin is an infinite offense in his sight, and sin demands his swift, white-hot wrath. So, verses 9 and 10, we see God judges men in their sin, but then, but Then God provides a mediator for sinners. This is the whole picture that Exodus has given us up to this point. Moses is the covenant mediator who goes back and forth between God and his people. The one who stands before the people on God's behalf and stands before God on the people's behalf. And God had set it up that way. When you get to Exodus 32 then, look back at the text. Look at verse 7. God says to Moses, after they sin, he says, go down to your people. Now think about it. If God was going to destroy the Israelites on the spot, then why did he send Moses down? The answer is that God was planning to spare his people through Moses' mediation. The reality of Exodus 32 is crystal clear. God will demonstrate his wrath against the people of Israel unless, 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 unless a man steps in and mediates on their behalf. And all of this squares with the unchanging perfections of God. God is holy. He will punish sin. At the same time, he is loving and merciful. He will be true to his covenantal promise to save this contemptible people. So how does he do it? How is God true to his unchanging perfections, his unchanging promises, while fulfilling his unchanging purposes? He does it through an unfolding plan. He appoints a mediator to stand in the gap for sinners. Isn't it ironic? At the beginning of this chapter, the people virtually disown the only one who can stand before God on their behalf. Yet in the middle of the chapter, we see him doing exactly that, interceding for them. And in so doing, so follow this, Moses is not changing the plan God had offered. He is fulfilling the plan that God had ordained. He's not changing the plan God had offered. He's fulfilling the plan that God had ordained. This unfolding plan of God is not unfamiliar to us in Scripture. We think of Jonah, whom God sent to Nineveh to proclaim this word, 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Nineveh was going to be destroyed because of their sin in 40 days. That's what God said at the same time God sent his prophet to tell them that. Why would God do that? Same picture we're seeing here. God was judging the Ninevites in their sin. At the same time, he was sending a preacher to warn them so that Jonah, after spending a few days in the digestive system of a fish, does in fact warn them. And Jonah 3 says, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented. He relented of the disaster that he'd said he would do to them, and he did not do it. It's the same picture. God judges sin. He provides a mediator through whom he displays mercy. But we don't look ultimately to Jonah in order to understand this unfolding plan of God, do we? Brothers and sisters, we look to Jesus. This is the gospel, right? In our sin, you and I stand under the judgment of a holy God. And he is compelled by the perfection of his character to condemn us, to destroy us. 
Death is not a hypothetical possibility for us. It is a sure and certain penalty, a concrete reality for you and me in our sin. But praise be to God, he has provided a mediator. It's ironic, isn't it? The very one we despise is the only one who can stand before God on our behalf. And God says to him, go down, Jesus. Go down because your people have become corrupt. They have turned away to all sorts of idolatry and immorality. And unless you intercede for them, they will surely be destroyed by my wrath. And Jesus comes down and he stands in the gap as a substitute for sinners. And because of his sacrifice, hallelujah, God relents his wrath from you and me. I am eternally grateful for the unfolding plan of God. This God, unchanging in his perfect justice and grace, purposed from eternity past to save me from my sin for his name's sake. He promised to raise me up to new life with him, and he did it all through the mediation of his son on my back. God's perfections, God's purposes, God's promises are unchanging, yet his plan is ever unfolding. Under his providence, mind you, and in his perfect plan, it makes perfect sense for God in his mercy to say, man's sin warrants my wrath, yet I will raise up a man to mediate on their behalf, and I will relent. Now, in all of this, see how what Moses knows determines the way Moses prays. See how Moses' doctrine of providence drives him to pray. He knows God is in control of all things, and he knows that doesn't make prayer meaningless. Instead, Moses knows that God has ordained prayer as a means by which he can and he must participate in God's plan. He knows God has purposes and he believes God is going to use his prayers to accomplish those purposes. Do we see what's going on here? God, in his providence, has chosen to make prayer a powerful means by which we interact with him and effectively shape the course of history. That is not an overstatement. That statement booms across the pages of the Bible. People pray and fire falls from heaven. People pray and lame walk and hungry are fed and the dead come to life. You look at the story of the church in Acts. Every major move of God in that book comes about in response to the prayers of God's people. They're gathered together in chapter 1, devoted to prayer. Chapter 2, the Spirit of God pours out on them like flames of fire, and 3,000 plus people are saved. Chapter 3, Peter and John go up to the temple at the time of prayer. By the beginning of chapter 4, many who heard the word believed, and the number came to about 5,000. Chapter 6, it says they devoted themselves to prayer at the beginning of that chapter, and just a few verses later, it says that the disciples were multiplying greatly in Jerusalem. The end of chapter 7, Stephen looks up to heaven and he prays. Right after that, you see in chapter 8, the church scattering, preaching the gospel wherever they go. Chapter 9, Paul is saved, connects with Ananias, all in the context of prayer. Same thing, chapter 10, Peter, Cornelius praying, and the doors open for the spread of the gospel to the nations. Chapter 12, Peter's in jail, church praying, an angel pokes him on the side and leads him outside. Chapter 13, church leaders worshiping, and they're fasting, and they're praying, and the Spirit says, set apart for me Saul and Barnabas for the work to which I have called them. And a missionary movement begins that will turn the Roman Empire upside down. Chapter 16, Paul and Silas are in the middle of prison, praying God brings an earthquake and a jailer and his family are saved. So yes, yes, yes. So I say it again. God in his providence, God in his providence has not called us in prayer to watch history, but to shape history for the glory of his great name. Now I know that some, maybe many, are still uncomfortable with that kind of language. But let's be clear what we're not saying. We're not saying God is an impotent king who's just sitting on his throne waiting for somebody to say something to him so he can start working in the world. That's not what we're saying. That's not what we're seeing in this text. Instead, we're seeing a God who wills to work through willing intercessors. What we're saying is when we pray, God responds. 
He, res- he responds. When we pray, we take our God-given place. Use our God-ordained privilege to participate with him in the accomplishment of his purposes on the planet. Oh, God help us to see. Moses prayed, and it had an effect. Big effect. God help us to realize when we pray, it has an effect. So, how does Moses pray? How does his doctrine of providence lead him to pray? How must our doctrine of providence lead us to pray? Three ways Moses prays. One, he he pleads. For God's mercy upon sinners. He pleads for God's mercy upon sinners. God saved them. God don't destroy them. And, and then notice the basis for Moses' prayer. He doesn't say to God, they don't deserve your wrath. Moses sees the severity of their sin. He knows God's wrath is exactly what they warrant. So instead of appealing to some inherent goodness in man, he appeals to the intrinsic glory of God. Save them, O God, for your name's sake. Show your majesty by showering them with mercy. And then later on in the chapter, so pick up in verse 31. Moses' intercession intensifies The Bible says in verse 31 of chapter 32, Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They've made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. What a prayer. To pray just like we see Paul pray in Romans 9, that he would be accursed and cut off for the sake of this people. Now Moses and Paul, they both know based upon the purposes and promises of God that that's not possible. This is part of what I mean when I say the role of desperate prayer in the mystery of divine providence. There's a desperation here. There's an exasperation even that says, God, whatever it takes, do whatever it takes. Take my own life if necessary, but glorify yourself in the salvation of these souls. Brothers and sisters, is this the way we pray? We plead like this. The salvation of souls around us in North America and among the nations. I just got back a few weeks ago from Nepal where I and a few of our pastors uh, took off from Kathmandu in a helicopter and went up near the border of Tibet into the Himalayan mountains basically about as high as you can get and still maintain consistent life. We landed there in a village and we spent the next six days hiking out through these villages about, about 90 miles. And, and saw that these villages give definition to urgent spiritual and physical need. So a, a study was done about 10 years ago in these villages that we were in and they found that approximately half of the children there were dying before their eighth birthday. Half their kids don't make it to eight. One mom had 14 kids. Two of them made it to adulthood. And they're, they're dying of things like diarrhea, simple things, just take a pill. This cholera outbreak in one village, this infection of the small intestine that causes diarrhea. Outbreak in the village, and in a matter of a couple of weeks, 60 people dead. Uh, when we were preparing to go into these villages, we had, of course, packs that we were hiking with with just very little supplies. Um, and the people who were, who were partnering with there in gospel ministry had told us that when we get in these villages, there will be uh, there'll be kids who will come running up to you and they'll start reaching their back. They just want something. And they said, we're, we're working in long-term ways to address the needs here, but the best 
way to respond there is, is not to just pull out your bag. If you've got one bar left, just give it because then you've got 100 other people coming around. So, so just keep your bags closed. And so we're walking through this one village and we get in, we get in the beginning of the village and this, this, this couple of little girls come up to us and this one little girl comes up and she's, she's reaching, she's kind of clawing into my bag and I'm kind of s- s- smiling and uh, I'm going to play with her. And she ends up grabbing onto my hand and so we held hands as we, we walked through the village and I'm holding this precious little girl's hand and she's looking up at me. And, we get near the end of the village, and we're, we're about to, to, to go on. She's obviously going to stay there, and she's reaching up again, like trying to grab something, and I'm kind of turning my bag away, and, and she's holding on tight to my hand, and then there comes this point, uh, there comes this point where I just, she's not letting go of my hand, so I just kind of yank, yank it away from her, and she looks at me, right in my eyes with this desperate, angry look, and she, she, she tries to spit on me, and she, she's not able to, she just ends up going all over herself. And so we went through village after village after village like this, and one of the one of the worst byproducts of this poverty is the sex trafficking in these villages. The traffickers will prey on the poverty of these families. The trafficker goes into a village, meets with a family, promises their daughter a better life if, if they'll let her go with them into the city, even gives the family money. So all it takes is about $100 to convince a starving family that it's worth selling their daughter off. Besides, it's going to be better off for her, right? So they give her away. And these traffickers pick up little girls, 15, 10, even 5 years old, take them down to Kathmandu, where they put these little girls in a brothel, and they break them, drug them, and rape them repeatedly, and then require them to do whatever the men who come into this brothels want them to do. Some of these little girls will have 15 to 20 customers a day. And this is their life. Shamed, used, abused, can't get out. Police corrupt because they're paid off by the traffickers. Traffickers threaten the girls. If they leave, they'll go back up and kill their families. So these girls that keep in Kathmandu, others taken into India, Middle East, North Africa. We're talking thousands and thousands of girls who are taken from impoverished villages like the ones we were in. And so if that's not enough, then on top of that, they're totally unreached with the gospel. It's 24 Tibetan Buddhist people groups. It was four days before we met anybody who'd ever heard about Jesus until we got there. There's this, there's this one moment where we're, we're standing actually uh, beside a, a Hindu holy river, and, uh, and there's tradition, custom, that when... When a family member dies, within 24 hours, you take the body, you bring it to this river, and you, you set up a funeral pyre over the river, and you burn the body over the river, let its ashes go down into the river. And this is helpful in reincarnation. And so we, we turn the corner, and we see this river, and it's funeral pyres spread out up and down the river, and these families cry and wailing over these bodies. And so I just stop. And I'm... I'm looking, so just get the picture. I'm looking at physical bodies who were alive the day before. Now I'm looking at them burning. And I know that what I'm seeing is a representation of a much, much deeper, graver, eternal reality. And I realize, as I'm looking at these bodies burning, I'm looking at these bodies and I realize most of them never even heard the gospel. They never even heard what we're together for. They never even heard it. And burn. So I'm praying, God, have mercy on them. 
God, have mercy on these men and these women and their families. God, have mercy on their kids. God, have mercy on these, these girls. I'm praying, I'm praying that God in his providence might use my pleading and the pleading of his people. God, wake us up to plead for the unreached. May God use our pleading to achieve his purposes in that place. To glorify your name, O oh God, as the defender of the poor and the deliverer of the slave and the savior of the people. Jesus, you've purchased, we read it earlier, we purchased, you purchased men and women for God from every tribe, every one of those people groups. So I'm pleading, God, do whatever it takes. Use my life. Take my life however you want to use it for the praise of your name in that place. So to our way, we pleading like that. For God's mercy on sinners. God have mercy on them. Which leads to what Moses prays next in Exodus 33. We pray, so this is the second way he prays. He prays. He pleads for God's presence and power among his people. Exodus 33, God ple Moses pleads for God's presence and power among his people. Look at the next chapter, first verse. The Lord said to Moses, depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your offspring, I will give it. I will send an angel before you. And I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you. I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you're a stiff-necked people. So God says, okay, the land is yours, but you won't have me. I won't go with, with you. In other words, you can have my promise, but you won't have my presence. What, what, what would you do if you were in Moses' shoes here? And be careful not to answer too quickly because you and I are tempted in a strangely similar way every day across our church culture. Th think about it. You and I are tempted every day in our lives and our churches to do the work of God apart from the power of the presence of God. Let's, let's, let's be honest with each other, brothers and sisters. We have created a whole host of means and methods in the church for doing ministry today that require little, if any, help at all from the Holy Spirit of God. We don't have to fast and pray for the church to grow. We have marketing for that. We don't have to pray for the crowds to come. We have publicity for that. It is possible. It is dangerously possible for you and I to carry on the machinery and activity of the churches we lead and it can be smooth, it can even be successful and we'll never notice that the Holy Spirit is absent from it. If we're not careful, we will deceive ourselves mistaking the presence of physical bodies in a building for the existence of spiritual life in a church. I wonder, I wonder if the greatest hindrance to the advancement of the gospel in our day may be the attempt of the people of God to do the work of God apart from the power of the Spirit of God. Maybe the greatest barrier to the spread of the gospel may not be the self-indulgent morality, immorality of our culture, but the self-sufficient mentality in the church, evident in our prayerlessness. So what does Moses do when he's faced with the prospect of doing God's work apart from God's presence? He Praise. He goes into the tent of meeting, verses 7 through 11. And then verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. You've said, I know you by name, and you've also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I've found favor in your sight, please now show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. So see it, Moses knows here there's an obvious discrepancy between what God is calling him to do and the resources he has to do it. He knows he can't do this work alone. He needs God to go with him and he will settle for nothing less. So he stays in the tent until God says, verse 14, my presence will go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. But even that's not enough for Moses. He continues, verse 15, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? Moses doesn't 
just want God's presence and power with him. He wants God's presence and power with them, with him and the people. He knows there's a corporate element to God's purpose in the world. So he pleads for God's presence and power among his people. Oh, brothers and sisters, we must pray in the same way. We need God to show the power of his presence in the midst of his people in our day. There is an obvious discrepancy between what God has called every one of us in this room to do and the resources we have to do it. We cannot shepherd the church in our own skill. We cannot program ministry in the church through our own power. We cannot make disciples in our neighborhoods and we cannot make disciples among the nations by mustering up more of our own might. We need God. We need, we need God. We need to fall on our faces and plead for God to show his power in his people. Isn't this why when you get to the page of the New Testament, you see so few exhortations even to pray for the lost and so many exhortations to pray for God's power in the church. For when God's power is present among his people, the gospel spreads to the lost. Matthew 9, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Harvest is plentiful. They're waiting to hear. So what do we pray for? Lord, wake up your people to go to work. Send your people out with power. This is mind-boggling that you and I would be called upon by Christ to tell God what he needs to do, who he needs to send to accomplish his purposes in the world. The mystery of Acts chapter 4, they're being persecuted. So what do they pray? Sovereign Lord, they start with the doctrine of providence. Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You anointed Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. And uh, to, uh, sorry, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. They knew, so they knew their persecution was preordained. So they, they prayed, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And what, what happened? When they prayed, the place in which they were gathered was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit of God and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Yes, they pleaded for the presence and power of God upon his people. And he answered, Acts 44, 33, with great power and apostles, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Next chapter, more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. Multitudes of both men and women. This is, this is how we pray. This is what we pray for. And this is how God acts. We pray for the power of God to fall on the people of God and God does it. And the effects give him glory. Huh. Brothers and sisters, let us not settle for prayerlessness and so settle for powerlessness. Let us throw aside our damning dependence on natural ability and human ingenuity and let us plead for God to do in our churches, across our country and among the nations, what only God can do. Jonathan Edwards said, only God is able to do the work of God. And it is his will that when God has something very great to accomplish for his church, Edwards said, it will be preceded by the extraordinary prayers of his people. We plead for God's mercy on sinners. We plead for God's presence and power among his people. And, and we plead, Moses pleads. Third, he pleads for God's glory on the earth. He pleads for God's glory on the earth as if Moses had not been bold enough already. So God has relented wrath. He's promised his presence among his people. If I'm Moses, I'm content at this point. But not Moses. He had prevailed with God in prayer. And yet he tarries in the tent and asks for one more thing. Verse 18, Moses said, please show me your glory. Just, just think for a moment about the man who's making this request. This is the man who got to speak with God in a bush that blazed with fire but didn't burn out. This is the man who saw had a front row seat on seeing God split a sea in half right before his eyes. A man who saw God lead him and his people with a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. This is the man who struck a rock and water came out to replenish his people. This is the man who prayed for food and bread fell from the sky. 
This is the man who, when everybody else was warned to stay away, he was invited to come up on Mount Sinai and commune with God. If anyone had seen the glory of God, it was Moses. He'd seen so much. But here's the deal. He, he wanted more. He, he wanted, there's something about the glory of God that once you taste it, you have an insatiable desire for more. And so he prayed, he pleaded for God to show him the fullness of his glory. God says, Moses, you don't know what you're asking for. A complete revelation of God and all his glory would annihilate Moses on the spot. Moses is pleading for that which would obliterate him. Yet God agrees to show him his back, a partial view, so to speak, which we see in the next chapter is a breathtaking glimpse of God's faithfulness and forgiveness, his goodness and glory in this. This is the end of prayer, isn't it? This, this is the termination of all supplication. We, we pray because we want God. We, we pray because we want to see Him. We want to know Him. Tozer said, I want deliberately to encourage this mighty longing after God. The lack of it has brought us to our present low estate, the stiff and wooden quality about our religious lives is a result of our lack of holy desire. Complacency is a deadly foe of all spiritual growth. Acute desire must be present or there will be no manifestation of Christ to his people. He waits to be wanted. Too bad that with many of us he waits so long, so very long in vain. We pray because we want God. We want to see Him. We want to know Him. And we want, we want His glory on the earth. This is how Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Did you hear it? You see it? Providence and prayer. His name will be hallowed. His kingdom will come. His will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And all of these things will happen in response to the prayers of his people. Revelation 8 tells us that the prayers of the saints are being stored up in the heavenly places. They are accumulating at the altar of God. Every single prayer for the kingdom of God to come. Every single prayer for the glory of God to be made known. Not one of them is lost in transmission. Not one of them is ever uttered in vain. Every single one of them is fueling the fire of incense that one day, one day soon, will usher in the climax of all history and the consummation of God's kingdom. So do not underestimate the role of desperate prayer in your life, your family, your church, and the mystery of divine providence in the universe. Plead, plead, plead for God's mercy upon sinners. Plead for God to relent His wrath. Plead for God's presence and power among His people. Plead for God's glory on the earth. Plead and plead some more and plead some more. Keep on bleeding until the day when Scripture promises us we shall see His face in all of His unchanging perfections as all of His unchanging purposes and promises come to pass in an ever-unfolding plan of which you and I get to play a part. Let's Let's pray, not as a routine formality to end our sermons, but as a relentless reality in our lives and our families and our churches. God, may it be so.